Welcome to another episode of Peopling the Past. I am Kara Cooney, a social historian and Egyptologist at UCLA. And we are going to be talking about women and power in ancient Egypt. Now, women and power in ancient Egypt is a, is a big topic. And at UCLA, I make it even bigger in my class, Women and Power in the Ancient World, by comparing ancient Egypt to ancient India, ancient Persia, Levant, Mesopotamia, Greece, Rome, and China. So you get some comparisons in there. But for the 10 or 12 minutes we have today, let's just focus on Egypt and all of these powerful women and why they were able to become so powerful. So the first reason is that Egypt is very different. Let's look at the map. You can actually see that Egypt is surrounded on two sides with formidable deserts, deserts that you can't get through that make it very hard for foreign armies to come into Egypt and invade. To the north, you have the Mediterranean Sea. Sea invasions are also really, really difficult. And then to the south, in the Nile itself, you have these big granite boulders that make it so that an invading army has to carry their ships around it. So until empires grow and get stronger and learn how to move fast, Egypt is very protected from the outside. And then look at that Nile carving a channel through that desert expanse. Egypt also provides a whole lot of cheap carbs, bread and beer, very easily farmed, very easily gotten by its people, which means you don't have a lot of internal competition as well. Not a lot of external competition, not a lot of internal competition. That means that you create a rule that follows itself quite naturally and easily such that you develop a divine kingship, a kingship that is so little shattered, so little uh, knocked aside by regicide or invasions that people think of it as divine. And that means that when one king has a problem, like a king dies early and a, and a young son comes to the throne, what's the best way of dealing with that? And this is where the women come in, is you invite a woman into power to rule on behalf of that young kid because she's got no profession of her own. She's got no, no, no help in this society to help gain more power for herself. So she's less of a threat. And that's why we see so many female rulers in ancient Egypt. Every now and then one of those women was able to take the crown for herself. So what kind of sources do I look at? A whole lot, many different sources, but because we're talking about power and people at the very top of society, many of my sources are textual. Those texts can come from inscriptions on a temple or a statue. They can come from different kinds of places like burial sites or tombs. Tombs are very important. Bodies are very important in ancient Egypt because they buried in the desert, all of that preservation is there for the historian to use. So we use archeology, span we use texts, we use any kind of material object like the, the objects of Tutankhamun that you see in the slide here. Those are very helpful for us to be able to understand the past. So how can this topic or material tell us about the real people in the past? Well, this is really difficult because the ancient Egyptians were always trying to perfect and idealize their past or their present. They're always trying to tell a story that makes everybody look good. So I, as the Egyptologist, have to come in and say, well, wait, what's really, what's really going on here? And try to understand if somebody is saying, oh, God gave me this power to rule. Well, I need to look at the real actual political structures that are going on the team that, that is ruling, how things might be competitive between certain people and try to figure out what is actually happening. Now, I want to lead you through six different women, five of whom became king, and just give you a little understanding of what their stories were like. The first is Mernaith, who did not become a king, but was buried as a king, and surrounding her burial were sacrificial victims so she got all of the honors, the pomp and circumstance that a king of dynasty one would have gotten. And she ruled on behalf of her son, Den, making sure that he was able to claim the throne, keep it and thrive. Our next female is Nefru Sobek of dynasty 12. And that statue on the left, it's not preserved anymore. It was destroyed in an allied bombing raid of Berlin. But if this was Nefru Sobek, she was a very fierce woman to behold. The statue on the right is definitely hers and there's an inscription there. It's in the Louvre today. 
And it shows you that Nefer Sobek is depicting herself as a woman, but she's taking on the trappings of kingship. She's got that striped Nemi's headdress that you know from Tutankhamun's mask, and she's tied on a kilt of kingship. Our next female ruler is Hatshepsut of Dynasty 18. And if you look at that image on the left, you would think, well, she's a man. She's depicting herself as a man. So many of her statues show her as a man. And that's because Hatshepsut took her power while acting as regent for her nephew. She then made herself the senior king alongside him. So because she's taking the primary place of power, she's got to show herself as a man. But if you're able to read the text like I am, you can see that she uses the pronouns she and her. So she gives it all away to her elites who know that she's a woman. And there are some statues like on the one on the bottom right that show her as a female. Nefertiti of Dynasty 18 is our mystery female king because until quite recently, she was just a pretty face. She was just considered the wife of King Akhenaten. But the more we look into her history and into her names, we can see that she ruled as co-king and then maybe even as king after Akhenaten's death. The reason it's so confusing and difficult to find her is that they change her names or she demands that her names be changed. So she goes from Nefertiti to Nefertiti Nefer Nefru Aten to Ankhepru Re Nefer Nefru Aten. And then she may actually be Smenka Re Ankhepru Re. That sounds confusing just to me to say. So if you're confused by that, imagine the Egyptians are trying to hide Nefertiti's femininity, trying to hide who she was changing her into something else as she moves along her path. She was just a wife and queen to Akhenaten, but then she becomes his co-king. And if you look at the steel on the bottom right, that's probably what's preserved here. She's ruling alongside her husband and is the only Egyptian woman to rule alongside her husband as king. If you ever want to start a bar fight amongst Egyptologists, which is always fun, you should suggest that Nefertiti was sole king as Smenkare after the death of Akhenaten. There is much disagreement about this and Egyptologists take this very seriously. Our next female king is Tawasret of Dynasty 19. This woman had to fight for her position. She wasn't born royal. She was the wife of a king and that king died. And then she was made regent of the next king, a king to whom she wasn't related at all. He wasn't her son. She may have actually had him killed so that she could take power and become the female king of Egypt. If that's what she did, it didn't end up well for her because after just a couple of years, another guy comes in, this warlord with the name Setnacht, it means Seth is strong. He comes in, takes her out and becomes king himself. What all of those details were of that competition and that warfare, we don't know, but this was one of the most complicated periods of Egyptian history. And then finally, we have Cleopatra of the Ptolemaic dynasty, who proves to us that no woman could rule alone on the throne of Egypt, even if they ruled for multiple decades. Cleopatra ruled first with her father, then with a brother. That brother started a war against her, and he was killed in that war. She rules with another brother. She has that brother assassinated, and with no more brothers left, and she knows she can't rule with any, with, alone on the throne, she looks abroad and she looks to the most powerful force in the Mediterranean, ancient Rome. Julius Caesar actually comes to her. He brings his garrison, sets up shop in Rome. They meet, hang out, they fall in love ostensibly, and they have a kid together whom Cleopatra names Caesarian. Now, it doesn't turn out really well, I think you know already. Cleopatra is in Rome when Julius Caesar is killed on the steps of the Roman Senate. She's got to hightail it back to Egypt. And she knows she can't rule alone. She's just got an infant. He can't be the, the male by her side. She finds Mark Antony and he finds her. And they end up trying to gain power together in the Mediterranean. Now that power doesn't work out as well as they had planned. Caesarian is getting older. He's, he's able to, to learn from his mother and from Mark Antony. But unfortunately, the two of them actually engage in a number of very difficult uh, war campaigns, one in ancient Iran, and then the Battle of Actium in ancient Greece. And when they lose that last one, Mark Antony commits suicide as a hero is supposed to. 
Caesarian is hunted down by Octavian who wins the war. And we are told that Cleopatra also commits suicide. I would like to encourage you to be critical of this story that Octavian is spreading, however. It's useful for him to say that Cleopatra took her way out like a, a hero of old, but it also makes her look very selfish because when a woman commits suicide, she abandons her family, she abandons her children to their fates, and indeed her children, most of them, were hunted down by Octavian and, and taken out of the picture entirely. Now to end this romp through 3000 years of history, I will leave you with this fact that success is ignored. Hatshepsut, that female king who did the best to make Egypt thrive during her reign is a woman whose name we can barely pronounce. Whereas Cleopatra, about whom we have Hollywood movies and Shakespeare wrote a play, she did not leave Egypt better than she found it. And her failure is aggrandized. It is made bigger than it is. So in conclusion, thank you all for watching. I hope that you're able to watch another episode of Peopling the Past. So do check out their website. And it was really fun for me to come and speak to you today.